I mean, we don't have a license for the title music. Hi. Today I want to talk about these things, Game Boy cartridges, or packs as they're officially called. Specifically, I want to talk about the information that is stored on these. I mean, yes, these cartridges contain all the game code, graphics and sounds that the game needs to run, but every single cartridge also contains 80 bytes of information that is not really accessible to you if you just play the game on a Game Boy. This block of information is what is called the cartridge header. So what kind of information is stored in there and what is it for? Well, let's find out. The 80 bytes of header information is located at the address hex 100 and continues until hex 14F. The first four bytes of the header starting at address hex 100, tell the Game Boy where the program on the cartridge starts. But why is that information in the header at address hex 100 and not at the very beginning of the cartridge at address 0? When you turn on a Game Boy, the very first thing that runs is the boot code that is located on the device itself, basically the Game Boy BIOS. This piece of firmware initializes various things and basically prepares the Game Boy to be ready to execute whatever code is located on the cartridge. On the original Game Boy, this BIOS is exactly 256 bytes long. The BIOS is located at address 0 all the way to address hex FF. After the BIOS has finished running, it will switch execution to the cartridge on the very next address after hex FF. The first four bytes of the header are basically just four bytes worth of machine instructions that are being executed right after the BIOS has done its thing. So if you look at some example code from an actual cartridge, the first four bytes in hex are 00, C3, 50 and 01. This translates into the following machine code. Hex 00 is for NOP, which means no operation. This basically instructs the Game Boy to do nothing for one cycle. Hex C3 is the instruction JP, which stands for jump. This instructs the Game Boy to jump to a specified address in the cartridge ROM and continue execution from there. The two bytes after the jump instruction make up that address. It is encoded with the lower byte first and the higher byte second. So hex 50 and 01 is basically address hex 0150. This means the Game Boy would jump to address hex 150 and continue execution from there. Address hex 150 is the very next address after the header information. So basically the first four bytes just tell the Game Boy to skip the header block. Most games do the same thing, but some other games might jump to an address further down in the ROM. Next in the header from address hex 104 to 133, so 48 bytes in total, are the Nintendo character bytes. This is the Nintendo Nintendo logo encoded in the Game Boy graphics format. When you turn on the Game Boy, the first thing you see is the Nintendo logo scrolling down the screen. The BIOS copies the Nintendo character data from the header into its memory and starts scrolling it across the screen. If you have ever turned on the Game Boy without a cartridge plugged in, you might have noticed that instead of the Nintendo logo, it will just scroll a black bar. That is because it couldn't copy any data from a cartridge into its memory, so the logo would just end up with the default values in memory, which results in black pixels. The BIOS also starts comparing the copied character data to its own copy in memory. This is the copy protection mechanism. If the bytes in the cartridge header are not exactly the same as the ones stored internally on the Game Boy, then the device would lock up and you wouldn't be able to execute any further code from the cartridge. This mechanism is fairly easy to bypass. Simply include the exact same bytes into your own cartridge and the Game Boy would run your code just fine. Except that data is from a trademarked logo and if you would distribute it without Nintendo's approval or licensing, then you would be liable for trademark infringement. After the Nintendo logo, you'll find the title of the game. It is 16 bytes long, going from address hex 134 to address hex 143. The title is encoded in ASCII and the range of allowed characters are shown in this table. Anything from hex 20 to hex 5f is a valid ASCII character, which basically contains symbols, numbers and uppercase letters. 
Any unused bytes of the title are to be encoded with zero, similar to a zero terminated string in C. The title has no real purpose on the Game Boy itself, but probably was used for cataloging purposes at Nintendo. That is pretty much the case with almost all the remaining bytes in the header. You could substitute these bytes with actual code and it would work just fine. Well, with the exception of a complement byte that we'll get to towards the end of the video. On newer cartridges, the title length has been reduced to 15 or even 11 bytes. This is due to the 4-byte game code located at address hex 13f to hex 142. This game code is also encoded in ASCII characters, which means if a title overlaps into the game code area, some of its characters would just be used as the game code. The purpose of the game code is unknown, but it probably was just a way for Nintendo to store registration information internally. The last byte of the title at address hex 143 is used in newer cartridges as the Game Boy Color support code. If the value is hex 80, it means this cartridge is Game Boy Color compatible and uses Game Boy Color features if played on a Game Boy Color. If the value is hex C0, it means it is a Game Boy Color exclusive and will not be playable on an original Game Boy. Any other value means it is a regular classic Game Boy game. You might have noticed that the values hex 80 and hex C0 are outside of the valid ASCII range for the Game Boy title. This has been done so an old Game Boy game wouldn't accidentally be marked as a Game Boy Color exclusive just because it used all bytes of the title with a valid ASCII character. On address hex 144 and hex 145 are two bytes that contain the maker code. This code identifies the publisher of a cartridge and has been assigned by Nintendo. The maker code itself is hexadecimal encoded as ASCII characters. So if Nintendo assigned the hex code 1F to a publisher, then the maker code bytes would be hex 31 and hex 46, as those are the ASCII codes for 1 and F respectively. This maker code, however, has been introduced in newer cartridges after the release of the Super Game Boy. Before that, the maker code was a single byte code on address hex 14B. An old maker code of 1 would indicate Nintendo, for example. If the byte on address hex 14B is hex 33, then a new ASCII encoded maker code has to be used instead. The rest of the header is a bunch of single byte values to encode information into it. On address hex 146 is the Super Game Boy support code. This can have one of two values, either 0, which means it is a regular Game Boy game that can also run on a Super Game Boy, or 3, which means that this game supports special features when played on a Super Game Boy, such as different color palettes, sound effects, or multiplayer support on the single screen. The next byte on address hex 147 describes the game pack type this cartridge is using. Each Game Boy cartridge could be shipped with various combinations of special features, such as rumble, a real-time clock, or battery-backed storage. Depending on the memory controller chip, it could also expand the ROM size of the cartridge from the default 32 kilobytes to something like 8 megabytes. A cartridge could also attach RAM and expand the Game Boy's internal memory. Each byte value stored in this address describes one set of such combinations. A value of 0 would mean that the cartridge is a simple 32 kilobyte ROM with no special features, while a value of hex 10 would mean this cartridge is using Memory Bank Controller 3 or MBC3 for short with a real-time clock, extra RAM and a backup battery. Nintendo cartridges ship with four different memory bank controller chips to choose from. The MBC1 with these combinations, the MBC2 with these combinations, the MBC3 with these combinations, and last but not least, the MBC5 with these combinations. Nothing would stop a company from using their own memory bank controllers, and in fact, some of them did use their own. The memory bank controllers I showed were simply the ones Nintendo offered to a company so they wouldn't have to design and manufacture their own. The byte on address hex 148 specifies the ROM size of the cartridge. A value of 0 means that this cartridge has an internal ROM size of 32 kilobytes, while a value of 8 means that this cartridge has an internal ROM size of 8 megabytes. The byte on address hex 148 9 specifies the RAM size of the cartridge. A value of 0 means that this cartridge does not ship with any additional RAM, while a value of 4 means that this cartridge contains an additional 1 megabytes of RAM. Then on address 14A 
is the destination code of the cartridge. This indicates for which market area this cartridge was intended. And in true Nintendo fashion, the market byte can either be 0 for Japan or 1 for all others. However, cartridges with code 0 have been released in other countries as well, while Japan also has received some games with code 1. So really, this identifier is kind of meaningless. And the last byte that carries any kind of registration information is the byte at address 14C. This is basically the version number of the cartridge. It starts out with version 0, and every time a new revision had to be made, the version number had to be incremented by 1. This does not mean that each version has been released to the public, but rather that it has been sent to Nintendo for verification, and it had to be revised due to issues found during the verification process. The last three bytes in the header are used for checksums. The byte at address hex 14D is the complement checksum of the header data. The checksum is calculated by adding up every single byte of the header from address hex 134 to hex 14C, and then adding hex 19 to it. The resulting value is then stored at address hex 14D. The Game Boy BIOS will calculate its own complement checksum of the header during the boot process and compare it with the value stored at hex 14D. If those two values do not match up, the Game Boy will halt execution. The last two bytes in the header hold the checksum of the entire ROM as a 16-bit value. The checksum is calculated by adding together every single byte of the ROM, apart from the two bytes that hold the checksum itself. This was a crude way to check if the ROM that has been submitted to registration hasn't been changed since approval. Because if the ROM was changed in any way after Nintendo gave the OK, it would most likely result in a different checksum. However, I could not confirm that this was actually the purpose of the checksum, so please take it for what it is pure speculation on my end. And that is all the data that has been included in every cartridge sanctioned by Nintendo. Now let me show you a little example application I wrote in C that is able to read header information from any ROM file on your computer. And as a reminder, you can get access to all the source code that I show in my videos by donating to my Ko-fi page. Monthly donations will also get access to the source code and binaries of projects that I'm currently working on. For example, um, at the moment I'm working on a Game Boy Assembler. So if you're interested, please check out the Kofi page below. Now let's have a look at the code. As you can see, I'm looping over all the command line arguments passed into this program. This is so you can pass multiple ROM files at once and it will print the header information for each file to the terminal. I'm opening the file right here and then I'm setting the current file cursor to position hex 100 as that is where the header block starts. And then I'm reading all 80 bytes of header information into an array, which I then pass to the print ROM header function. This function then prints the header title and all the bytecodes stored in the header to the terminal. And if I run this program now, with free ROM files of games that I own, you can see the following results. So here we can see the ROM file for Tetris, and we see the starting address is exactly that, the jump instruction, or to address 150. We have the game title, no game code, no Game Boy Color support or Super Game Boy support. It uses the old maker code, so one just means Nintendo basically. Game pack type is like the very simple one with no extra ROM or RAM sizes. Um, destination code is Japan, even though this has been released uh, in Europe and the US as well. Uh, the ROM version is zero. And then you see the complement check and the checksum. Now the same for slightly more modern game, uh, Var Varia Land 2. So here we have the same thing, jumps to one address 150. We have the game title, no game code. It has, however, Super Game Boy features. Old maker code of hex 33, which means it uses the new maker code instead, as you can see here. And those are the hex codes for the ASCII characters 0 and 1. And we know from the old maker code 0 and 1 just means Nintendo, so there you go. This is the new maker code for Nintendo. Then it uses the game pack type 1, 3, so you can probably figure out from the table that I showed before what that means. And then also um, it has a bigger ROM size and it has some additional RAM attached to it. And then we have a Game Boy Color game here, which is Pokemon Silver Edition. Here you can see the game title, Pokemon SLV. And then this one actually has a game code and the game code is AAXE. So we see here Game Boy Color support of Hex 8.0 and also Super Game Boy support. Uh, again, it uses the new maker code right here. It has game pack type 10 
and then again extra ROM and RAM attached to it. You can figure out the sizes based on the table that I showed in the video before. And that is all I have on this topic. I hope this was interesting to you and you can now go ahead and look at your ROM files and read out the header information and see what kind of data is stored in there. I would like to thank my Kofi supporters for this month. You're really helping me out to get going with these videos. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day and see you next Friday. Bye. This is probably the stupidest thing I have done to date. <laughs>